wanted to um, well thank everyone again and, and then continue on with our discussion from uh, this morning on CIOs and the uh, age of AI. And it, what I wanted to do was um, talk a little bit of background on, on how AI has developed over the last 40 or 50 years and how it's different today. Um, substantially different to such an extent that it's leading to changes in, in how it's policy regulation and, and management of it. Um, oh, here we go. Um, so today's AI, the, the ones that are mostly in the news, are, are different substantively. They're different because of the underlying technology, which includes the uh, processing power, the, the uh, communications speed, and also the, the data storage. So just as the uh, smartphones in 2008, 2009 were enabled by innovations and, and great advances in processing speed, communications, and, and storage, so today these are. Um, one kind of background uh, point, I think, is how rapidly these underlying uh, technologies have advanced. So the one gigabit of one gigabyte of storage uh, the first commercially available one gigabyte of storage was, was in 1980, which really wasn't all that long ago. And it was the size of a refrigerator, weighed, weighed 550 pounds, and cost $40,000. And it was, uh, it was IBM that made it commercially available. Today you can go to the store and for $40 or $50 buy three terabytes in the size of a, a small book. Um, in communications, the first transatlantic cable um, can only carry less than 100 phone calls about 100 years ago. Now three or four million or more phone calls on a fiber optic cable. And processing speed, by coincidence, the first Apple computer and the first lunar lander, they both had processing speeds of 2,048 cycles a second in the early uh, 70s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And now it's eight, nine uh, billion uh, cycles a second. And so it's this great advance which has enabled the smartphone, but enabling this too. The other difference with this is the uh, access and the connection to vast amounts of data, which we'll talk about and talk about some of the legal challenges. So th this is uh, from a software called uh, MidJourney. Um, so it's a generative AI program. It, it's text to image. Um, so you type in a, 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 some text and it generates an image. Uh, this photo here, or this image, was quite controversial because the artist here won a um, digital art competition. And so the controversy was whether someone who uh, just creates uh, by putting in a small amount of text, generates that, uh, should be eligible to win. But there was a subsequent controversy too. He wanted to uh, take this to the market and be able to sell these images. Uh, so he went to the US Patent and Trademark office but made a filing for a, a, a copyright on that image. And the Patent and Trademark Office said no, no that it wasn't, um, didn't meet the standard of human creativity. Just typing in the small prompt and having the computer develop this um, wasn't human creativity and so he wasn't eligible. So he's going to take that to court. And then subsequently, um, many artists and also on, on the um, text ones, uh, have filed lawsuits saying that these systems are taking art that is copyrighted, um, doing machine learning on it, the, the training, and then putting it out to the public and making it available. Um, so really quite, quite fascinating from a, a legal standpoint. Uh, this is just, I, th I think, kind of a, a, a neat image, again from Midjourney, uh, that, that I did with the prompt of, a, of cats walking down the Las Vegas Strip. But you can see you can get some quite good images from it. Um, where I think it's, where it becomes more interesting, though, is with some of the systems such as ChatGPT, which is um, here. This is doing computer coding. Um, so in R, there's an available data set called MT cars, which has a um, dependent variable as um, miles per gallon. It has like eight or 10 deep independent variables, such as number of cylinders, uh, engine displacement, and things like that. And so here was uh, just a prompt to uh, do a plot uh, asking um, the computer, uh, ChatGPT, to generate the code to do a plot 
of miles per gallon versus number of cylinders. So pretty straightforward code, but it raises a lot of issues for education. Um, so if the computer can generate this, um, a student then can, can do the same, and there's the potential down the road that computer programming classes won't be starting from scratch. They'll be starting from a system such as this, asking it to develop the code, and what the student will do and will learn from is troubleshooting the code and to get it to work on their own computer. Um, one other interesting aspect of this, which we'll discuss, is th these models are, are probabilistic. So if you type in the same prompt uh, two or three minutes apart, you'll get a slightly different answer. Um, maybe not in this one, because it's so simple, but, but if the code is more involved. So if you ask this to do a um, machine learning model uh, to actually do a, a, a regression uh, of the miles per gallon and the um, cylinders, um, and you have the workflow, you'll get slightly different workflows, even though it's the same prompt. And so that raises some of the issues for the, the public and, and for CIOs um, in that it is probabilistic. It's looking into the future for the next word, the next two words, um, but you can get vast, quite different answers. So as another example, if I asked it to do a five-day itinerary for a vacation in Samarkand, um, and I ask it now and then in two minutes, I'll, I'll get a different response. Uh, they might be close, but they may well be, be different. And so um, for the CIOs and, and for the public, it's, it's something to be aware. Um, but where did it, so how is this different than um, AI from 30 or 40 or 50 years ago? This is one of the first, this was a, a program out of Silicon Valley called Mycin to uh, diagnose and then recommend treatments for bacterial, uh, bacterial diseases, blood carrying diseases. And the way it operated was it was an expert system and the computer programmer sat down with the, the doctor and they went through a series of questions, uh, if then type questions, uh, um, like a decision tree, and ultimately uh, arrived at the, the um, result, whether or not the person most likely or did not likely have a, a bacterial illness and which one. So you can imagine that today for COVID, uh, if the patient arrives at the hospital and has a fever, then there's a, a, a chance that, that we want to ask them more questions. Um, if they have a fever and then they have a, a, a chest X-ray, which is positive, even more likely. Uh, if you take a subsequent test and, and ask then um, if their C-reactive protein is above a certain level, then even more likely that they have COVID. And so that's how AI was for, for many, many, many decades, these expert systems. But today it's, it's different. <clears throat> um, here, this worked the same. This was um, Gary Kasparov, the world chess champion a number of years ago from um, uh, Russia, Soviet Union, um, and playing against Deep, Deep Blue, the uh, IBM computer. And so the way this computer worked, it was almost the same as Mycin. It looked into the future supercomputer, many, many moves. And in the future, it did an evaluation of the position, uh, how good the position was for each player, and it gave it a score. And then it selected the next move in the path by the highest scores out of eight or 10 moves. <laughs> and the evaluation mechanism for the score was based upon uh, human masters working with computer programmers to develop the algorithm. And so the chess programs weren't very good in the beginning because these evaluation algorithms weren't very good. But over time, they got better and better until ultimately, um, Deep Blue, the computer, uh, defeated Gary Kasparov, one of the best um, chess champions of all time, in, in a, a chess match. But again, th that's the um, previous way of, of doing artificial intelligence. Um, IBM then applied that to uh, natural language processing in this game called Jeopardy. Um, and again, the, the computer did very well. Um, but today, the, the, the programs are much, much different. So that the, the best chess playing program in the world now um, wasn't developed with uh, human chess masters. It was developed at Google. Um, and all Google did was program in the moves of chess and have the computer play itself millions and millions of times. A, a very, very large and capable computer. <clears throat> and the computer. Uh, by playing itself millions of times and, and learning from each iteration, 
uh, developed a style that really wasn't like a computer, really isn't like a human, but, but the, the best player and the, the best um, entity now, now in the world. And this is the way AI is, is, is today with these types of approaches where um, either an adversarial approach or taking very, very large, vast amounts of data, information, books, art, uh, feeding it into the computer and either labeling the, the data, um, such as whether or not someone has heart disease and with the characteristics, <coughs> or not labeling and having to do a classification and, and to, to draw inferences and conclusions. Um, and so that's, that's where we are uh, today. Um, so there's great challenges with this, though. There's obviously the legal challenges, the privacy challenges, bias. There was a program at, at Google again. They were using a, an AI program to uh, <coughs> make hiring decisions, interview decisions for uh, new staff. <coughs> and they ended up having to uh, stop using it because the AI program was selecting mostly males. It was, the AI program was trained under existing workforce, which is mostly male. Um, and then selecting people that were mostly male. And so it was showing a, a bias based upon the training, work set, the training set. This, this was the IBM program applied to cancer diagnosis and treatment. <clears throat> and again, this one didn't work out because the underlying data, uh, the data from the, the hospital records, the medical records, um, it, was it wasn't data set that was able to be um, used that well for training because it was unstructured or inconsistent structured, incomplete. And as a result, some of the diagnosis and treatment recommendations were, were actually dangerous. <clears throat> so there's these underlying questions of how you actually manage the training, how, how good is the data set, um, how repeatable is it, and then once you have the system, how do you ascertain what the, the, the bias and the privacy concerns and the cybersecurity are for it. Um, and so that, that's where the, the role of the CIO and, and um, CIO councils and executive councils come in. Uh, this is from the International Academy of CIO um, uh, uh, tra training or executive education um, accreditation handbook. <clears throat> and so over the years and in partnership with the different national chapters had developed a set of CIO co core competencies um, it relates to what many countries have done. I think one of the things that, that through working with different countries, um, we've done is um, recognize that there's a tailoring of CIO core competencies uh, nation to nation. Uh, and so there's some that, that are individual based and individual perspective, some that are organization perspective and some that are field perspective, but there is a, a tailoring. <clears throat> One of the, um, recently all the countries struggled with COVID, and so AI was um, in the forefront of COVID with some successes, but with some notable failures. Um, and I think that it highlighted a, a, a lesson for AI and a lesson for IT leadership. <clears throat> um, so of course, COVID was a, a crisis, and a lot of research was being rushed into the uh, field and rushed into the marketplace. Um, and some of the ones that did not work out for, we'll come back to this, <clears throat> for COVID and AI was on X chest x-rays. And this is from a, a journal, uh, Radiology Business, and they did an evaluation of 300 um, imaging AI programs that were developed for COVID. And they found that none were fit for purpose, none were fit for use. <clears throat> um, some of them showed a, a, a bias. They might be fit for a hospital in one area, for example, Oxford, but not fit, fit for Ox England overall, given different demographics and populations. Uh, some were from very small data sets. <coughs> um, some uh, lack cybersecurity or, or privacy, and, and some, they, they weren't repeatable. Uh, so they, they weren't accurate and they weren't repeatable. But I, I think a, a, a caution and really highlights the issue of what sort of test or assurance does someone have before you put a system into play, into practice? And then how do you monitor it in an ongoing uh, basis? JP, sorry. Three yes, minutes. one minute. Yeah, yep. um, 
I mentioned this earlier, the diabetic retinopathy one. And where I'd like to end, <coughs> if I delete it, is this question of risk. And what's interesting, I think, is that the question of risk is similar for, for medical and also similar for autonomous vehicles and, and similar for other applications of AI, where the AI is taking the place of the human. Uh, there's one side where it's all human and human operated. Uh, there's another side uh, where it's all machine operated, such as an autonomous vehicle or a fully machine surgery. And then there's these middle categories where it's increasing automation, increasing autonomous driving, or increasing use of the machine in surgery. Uh, and so the question then is how to um, categorize the, the risk for the applications that everyone's undertaking, whether it be autonomous sur surgery or driving or other applications in, in the workplace, um, identify how much the machine is doing, what risk there is from that, and then how it's going to be uh, managed. So, so uh, thank you very much um, for, for the talk.